Hi everyone, Sarah here from Sarah Humphrey Embroidery. Um, welcome to another video. Uh, welcome especially if you're new to our channel. Do check out all our other videos. We've got over 230 now. You can see those very easily just by clicking on my name below this video. And welcome back if you're a regular watcher. It's nice to see you again. So I've got another two books that I want to show you um, from my collection today. Two books that I love and to show you why I like them so much. So today we're going to look at English Medieval Embroidery followed by late medieval and renaissance embroidery so a little bit of European embroidery so two books that go really well together so let's have a little delve inside so we're going to have a look at English medieval embroidery first um, and this book accompanied an exhibition at the Victorian Albert Museum in London and one that I actually taught for, taught um, a medieval embroidery class for them and this is the catalogue for that um, and both of these books by the way at the time we're making this video are still available you can buy those new um, around £25 paperback for both and this one's also available in hardback. So the first thing that I want to show you is this. So this is um, a piece of embroidery found in the tomb of St Cuthbert um, and what's wonderful about this is it's the only Anglo-Saxon piece of embroidery found to have figures on it and it's extremely old. It's 909 to 916, um, so a very old piece of embroidery and you can actually still see this embroidery. It's held in Durham Cathedral in an exhibition down in the Bolton Durham Cathedral and it's tiny, it's only about this big. Um, but it's absolutely beautiful. It's glistening with gold. Um, so really worth, if you're in the UK, if you're in, in Britain, going to see this because um, it's such um, such amazing condition, such an old piece of embroidery. So it starts with that. So this is the very beginning of medieval embroidery um, in England. It's a great place to start. So this book talks all about the history of medieval embroidery, there's loads and loads of information in there and I'm not an expert by any means so um, do have a good read of it to learn all about that. But I wanted to start here, so English embroidery um, was known as, um, medieval embroidery was known as Opus Anglicanum but not in Britain, only in Europe, so it was English work, so people wanted to do the work that looked like English work, so we didn't call it that, <laughs> other people called it that, um, and it's kind of the pioneers of this, this is where it was first done, and I wanted to show you this face, but this is the head of King Solomon, because this is beautiful close-up detail, and in a way the book you can get closer to the images, um, to the pieces in the book than you could in the actual exhibition because they were all in glass cases and it was quite dark. Um, so a really wonderful resource if you're very interested in, in old embroidery and getting right up close and seeing how it was practically made. Um, so a lot of um, split stitch in those days, very few different stitches that they used. Um, so you can see the split stitch here in the hair. I love this stri stripy hair. This comes in again later. We'll have a little look at that. So just rows and rows of a single stitch. So it's just a split stitch, which we have a video on. Um, and I will mention some videos in this, by the way, um, that we've got that are relevant to this. Um, so do check those out as well. So split stitch rows in the hair and it would be in silk this and the silk would shine depending on the light hits it um, and that would, what would give it some dimension so quite simple stitches really the face would have been the same but it's actually worn away quite a lot in this one but you can see in the cheek how it goes round and round so they would use the direction of the stitches to give the face some dimension and we've got some outlines here for the facial features so they're quite cartoon like in a way they're not very realistic um, but I think that's quite cute. I quite like that about them. So that's the head of King Solomon. And what I also want to show you while I'm looking through this book, because I taught medieval embroidery quite a bit, I've got a few samples that I taught. So while we're looking at King Solomon, I'm just going to show you these ones. So these are little class samples. Some of you watching might have done this class with me in various places. Um, so I sort of based this head on King Solomon really and this is a very simple one so just to look at the hair and how to do the split stitch in the hair and we've got some jewels on there jewels these are beads <laughs> and some gold couching which I'll talk about a little bit later on in the book as well so just a simple to show you how the head was formed and then I filled it in to show how to do the split stitch shading so we have two videos on this project if you fancy having a go at stitching a 
King Solomon's face. And then another one here with lots of jewels on. Now they did like to use precious metals. They used real gold in their threads. They used um, real precious stones as well in there um, and real pearls. So these things were real items of luxury. Only um, the very rich had these. So the church had them, noblemen had them. Um, because of obviously the, the expensive materials involved. So those are the three versions of it. So they're quite good, quite good fun. So it talks a lot about how the embroideries were made as well. And um, some costs here, which are quite interesting about how much something cost to make back in, in um, med medieval times. And some nice close up images. So the next one I wanted to show you was this little lion so he thought he appeared on something a bit smaller but he is about inch high two and a half centimeters high so he's tiny and these are real pearls that they used so I actually had to go at making one of these mine is somewhat crude compared to the original but these are real pearls and these are the actual smallest ones I could find um, and they're nowhere near small enough this would have been a little bit smaller than this the original and it's got much more um, pearls in it than I've got in mine so finding these materials now is quite difficult so in medieval times to have these would would really be quite special quite something um, so this is my attempt at him in the materials I could get of the day um, so that was quite fun as well I quite enjoyed that So we've looked at King Solomon's head um, and I wanted to show you um, a few more heads. They're really characterful um, and really cartoon-like and they've got wonderful expressions on them and you can almost read what they're all saying to each other. I'm too sure what he's doing to her. This is St Margaret and I've actually had a little go at St Margaret as well. So here she is. Um, and quite interesting, even though these are simple stitches and the faces are simple, um, they're quite hard to to replicate in a way. They come out with quite a character of her own. She looks a little bit, well, she's not as cheerful as she is in this one, put it that way. She looks a bit, yeah, not sure what the word is for that. I'm sure you can come up with a word. Um, but again, the stripy hair, all in split stitch and using the split stitch to make the definition of the face. Um, so really interesting to have a go at those faces. They're not as easy as they look. So loads of really wonderful images in here, loads and loads. You didn't have to see the exhibition to appreciate the book. So I want to show you a few more faces. I hope that Jonathan can zoom in on this for me so you can see these wonderful little set of characters here. And when I was doing the class for this, I actually went through the book and just drew some of the faces. Just show you those here. And just literally some outlines for them because they really are wonderful images and very easy just to copy. They're not complicated. You don't need to be able to draw faces to do this. They're quite cartoon like. And just did lots of images from the different ones. So here she is again. And here's King Solomon here. So a um, couple from profile as well, which is in half profile and then some from straight on. So a very easy way of getting a simple design if you wanted to have a go at working one of these figures. Now I wanted to show you this page because this is relevant, re very relevant, easy for me to say, to um, have on my channel. So if you're familiar with my channel, you will know probably the prick and pounce technique of making the holes in your design, rubbing the powder through and that transfers the design onto the fabric. Got loads of videos on that, but this is it in action here. So um, this is from 1490, um, a pricking from 1490. So I just wanted to show you how old this technique was um, and, and how um, it's tried and tested, basically. Um, it's been used throughout the centuries. Lots of different people used it. Leonardo da Vinci used it and Michelangelo as well. But here's an actual pricking of this design. Now, this is actually reversed, um, which it wouldn't normally be. So I don't know if they reversed that in the book or if there's some reason that's reversed. And it's in quite poor repair. But you can see the dots here. So you would put this over your image. You'd make the dots through the paper, you put that onto your fabric, you rub some powder through it and that design transfers onto the 
fabric. So just really interesting to see that they were using this technique back then. So this one's got a little bit of everything on it. So this has got um, the face that we've looked at already. So this and um, this split stitch shading. It's got some pearls, and I think this this is an angel. I think she's holding some sort of star or sun in her hand. Not too sure what it is. This is here's one of the lion heads without the pearls on it. So the thread holding the pearls has probably disintegrated um, and gone rotten, and the pearls have fallen off. Um, so you can still see the head, but without the pearls on it here. So it's quite bad condition. And then I just want to talk about what the gold was. So the gold thread actually had gold in it, and um, they used a technique called underside couching which we've also got videos on, lots of videos on these techniques. So if you want to have a go, there's loads of um, information there for you. Um, and then you would lay the gold on top of the surface and you would bring a stitch up from underneath, go back down the same hole and you would pull it through to the back. So the stitch sits on the back, but most of the gold sits on the front. So you think how much these materials would have been worth in those days. Um, and you want all of the gold on the top and not on the back ideally because you're wasting it so this was a technique that they used um, in very early um, embroideries like this um, so that you could see most of the gold um, and you could make patterns with it and we'll have a look at another one later to see the different patterns so this is all gold thread on here and it's all been couched using this underside couching method so the gold sits on the top and it's beautiful and shiny and you can see all of that opulent gold Right, so this one is the John of Thanet panel and the reason I wanted to show you this, it looks a little bit clumsy compared to the ones we've been looking at, but it's these little things in the corner. So um, I like to take my inspiration from, from history, but maybe do it with a little twist. I don't necessarily want to create the whole of this panel because that's quite a lot of work in that. So I took this tiny little sun here um, and I do hope you can see that. Um, we can zoom in on that or I'll put a picture up if we can't get close enough because this is a sun and this is a moon. And here is my piece on that. So I took the sun and I made a little project out of it. And this was a day class that I taught in quite a few places. And this was to practice this split stitch shading in the face and then we did a little bit of underside couching around the edge and it's a good idea if you're practicing underside to do it in a thread first um, and then try it in the gold so you don't waste any gold and um, because it does take a little bit of a knack to get the right tension on it so that's why we've got some in red that was the practice run and then we went round in gold and we did it in the gold thread as well so just to show you how you can take some inspiration from a piece you don't have to do the whole thing you can just take a little bit that interests you and I think I was planning on doing the moon as well and having a pair but I didn't get get around to doing that but that would have been a really great um, uh, great project um, two pieces together like all right so this is the Bologna coat and this image doesn't do it justice because all of this is stitched the whole entire thing this would have been worn it's shoulder to floor um, it's a semicircle, so you can imagine how big this would have been entirely covered in stitching. So all of these figures are like the ones that we've been looking at. These will have been um, split stitch shaded um, and the background split stitch um, on its own. Sorry, not shading, just some split stitch for the figures. And then the background is all gold and you can't really see it in this. But all of this behind here would have just shimmered with gold. It's absolutely stunning um, to see these pieces in real life um, from the Victorian Albert Museum because um, you just wouldn't, if you didn't see them, you wouldn't believe they were possible. The sheer amount of stitching in it was incredible. And the apprenticeship to do this kind of work was um, seven years long. And you're only really learning two or three different stitches, different techniques to do it. You're not learning 25 like I did in my three-year apprenticeships it's seven years to learn how to do this and the girls would have started very young as well aged 14 um, because your eyesight just wouldn't have been good enough um, later on in life so they started young so that they could see how to do this work but just wanted to show you it all in context and how this all works together and what the end result was because it is it is quite spectacular
So I just want to go back to the underside couching and the gold because it didn't just save the gold down and fill in the background with gold. They made patterns out of that because they didn't have enough work to do as it was. Um, and here's some different patterns. So this is all gold thread in the background all around these figures. And I hope you can see the different patterns and really quite complex patterns. They weren't just stripes or, or squares. Um, we've got round shapes in there. We've got leaves in there. And they would have just changed the direction that they laid the gold down to get this different effect. So just relying on purely the stitch direction of the gold to create these different patterns in the back. It's an absolutely stunning use of the underside couching technique. And if you've ever had a go at it, it does take a little bit of practice to get into it. And the thought of doing all this patterns, it is quite crazy, um, really. So just stunning to see that work that's just gone into the background alone. Um, just wanted to show this little chap. The pictures are super in here. You can spend hours looking at them. But I just really liked his stripy, <laughs> stripy hair. And when I tried to teach it, we were so used to shading everything and blending everything. And getting people to do stripes was actually quite difficult. It's like, no, you can literally do stripes. So he's got yellow, red and green striped hair, which I just think that's really funny. So this is a steeple Aston cope. And you may think that doesn't look like a cope because it's not anymore so this was at the end of the exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum and it used to be a cope and it got chopped up they cut all this amazing beautiful work up and turned it into um, an otter frontal <laughs> um, and it's in quite bad condition there's lots of bits of it missing so it's been well worn um, and used um, quite frequently and obviously been cut up and remade into something else so somebody thought it wasn't worth keeping as a cope anymore but this is um, another sample of something that I took for a design. Now I have to find him. Now you won't be able to see this because it's too small, but in here there's some little green men all over this. And there is, hopefully, there's a close up here. Let me make sure you can, he's just off the edge of the page, but here's this little green man. And here's my little green man. So this I did for a class at the Victoria and Albert Mu Museum um, and it's also in the book for um, the V&A book Embroidery and Maker's Guide as well so you can actually have a go at this if you want to and it was again an exercise in doing the split stitch for the face and some underside couching so those two techniques come up again and again um, and I just thought he was a lovely little um, motif and quite unusual as well um, to see a green man I thought something this early um, and alternate colours as well so I've done some green and some gold and swapped the colours over so you can have a little play with it so just to show you how you can, again how you can take one little bit of this and have a play and make a really nice design out of it So again, another cope, um, just getting more and uh, more crazy every time you get you, you reach one really. More figures, more gold, more silk um, silk split stitch for the figures, covered in gold. Um, just absolutely stunning. Some really beautiful pictures in this book. So I'm going to end this book on that one and then we'll just have a quick look at the other one, which sort of follows on from this period. So another catalogue from an exhibition. So this is from um, a gallery um, and a dealer in London called Sam Fogg. And they had an exhibition of medieval textiles, which I didn't actually get to see, but they do have a book about it. Yay. So this is their book. So this has got some slightly different things in it. So this is a little bit later than English. Um, the Europeans were starting to copy the English style, the Opus Anglicanum. Um, but of course, as when you try and copy something everything always changes a bit so it's quite a, a different style um but just um this was quite interesting um so more of a, a shading style now less of a split stitch and more of a shading so you'll see the techniques change as we start to go through it as well so again some beautiful images Let's flick through a few i wanted to show you this so this is english and it says probably London. Um, most of this work was done in London. This is where the guilds were. This is where the training was. But they did branch out to some of the cathedral cities as well and do it. But mainly it did come from London. So we're talking sort of end of the medieval period now. So 1480 to 1500. And um, what's interesting about this is how um, 
the styles change. So we have those enormous copes completely covered in gold embroidery. Um, and now it's kind of like, oh, we can't do the whole thing. It takes too long. <laughs> we'll just do the middle bit. So they just did this bit and they applied that onto a velvet background. So it's still a huge amount of work, but you can just see how that starts to change and people think these cost too much, they take too much time. How can we make them um, easy, more affordable to do? And that's what they would do. They'd just do a panel and they'd apply it to something else. So again, some beautiful close-ups of the actual embroidery. And what's interesting with this one, we know what this one is five orphrey panels so these um this is from the netherlands so you start to see a little bit of a different style as they try to copy this op opus anglicanum technique but they're not using split stitch <clears throat> anymore to do their shading they're using what we would call needle painting or silk shading now um, it's all vertical all the stitches go straight up and straight down which we would call tapestry shading um, but you can see how it's a little bit more dimensional now. There's more colours coming into it. There's more three-dimensional form. So it's moving away from that cartoon-like um, style of the Opus Anglicanum and becoming much more realistic now. They look less like cartoons and more like how people may have actually looked um, and using these different techniques as well. Here's two more from that set, absolutely stunning they are. And the colours are very vibrant as well now. These colours have remained, these have been kept in excellent condition for these greens to, to still remain green and the blue down here. So lots of this um, silk shading technique now. And some gold on the top, but now with the gold you can actually see the stitches. So they didn't do the underside couching, they would put the stitches over the top, it's much quicker to do um, and maybe the materials were more available <clears throat> the later on in the period as well so it was much quicker to do this so just couched over the gold and you can actually see the stitching here's another one that's been applied on the top um, and I just want to show you this detail here because this is very beautiful I think it's this one here it is so two angels here and this is all gold as well now this is worked I believe it said it was worked on linen so you didn't need to work it on the expensive materials because you're covering it all in embroidery you can work on something that's quite sturdy and quite solid um, and stitch on it here and it also uses a technique that we would know as all new way which is new gold um, and you make the shading by the colour of thread that you use over the gold. So you stitch over the gold, you couch over it now, so not underside couching, and you use that colour of that thread to do some shading. So you can probably see it in this background cape here, these dark greens. So the gold is laid horizontally, and then the stitches are worked over the top, and the colours of the stitches are changed to create the shading. So another technique is now coming into it. We're moving away from just those basic techniques originally and putting more and more techniques in here. So this is Central Europe and Bohemia, 1500. Um, quite a different one, this. And again, I want to show you this technique in more detail, um, but quite a different set of colours as well for this. And um, we're getting a little bit three-dimensional now, which is what we would think of as stump work. So this is early stump work. I think this is a close-up of it um, and this would have been gold it's all tarnished so it's um it's gone a browny gray color um, and but you can still see the faces so they're still doing um, like a split stitch shading but it's over a form these have got dimension their cheeks are sticking out and their chins are sticking out and they've got little pointy noses as well so it's starting to really bring these characters out so it's going a little bit back to um, cartoon like again in a way and I think they're a little bit creepy actually I'm not totally sure I like those but just interesting to see these other techniques coming in here's another one here and this one is interesting because you can see the image that they would have used for it so the two figures looking up at Christ on the cross there's his feet here it looks like he's got stockings on um, they're a little bit crude again it's almost losing some of its its refinement I think um, and a skull and crossbones at the at the bottom um, again three-dimensional work so this sort of weird cross between this cartoon like technique but this quite serious subject um, 
yeah I do think they're a bit disturbing not sure I like these ones very much so loads more images in the book loads of history about it some different techniques and some different pieces from all around Europe and then I thought we would just end with this one here this is a pair of orphrey bands so these ones are Italian from Florence um, same subject matter but slightly different style if you studied it enough you'd be able to see this quite clearly and we'll just have a little look at a close-up of that because they are beautiful so here's some more of this or new way couching so the gold is horizontal the stitching is making the folds in her in her dress and then we've got this gold in the background couch down now so stitched over the top in a different pattern and all around a halo as well so really beautiful patterns you can make with this gold and all around here lots and lots of gold on there so i hope you've enjoyed that little look into these books they are beautiful books about medieval embroidery if you're interested in this there's not many books around on medieval embroidery there's not many pieces of medieval embroidery around either so i hope you've enjoyed this and you can see why i love these books so much so I hope you've enjoyed that little trip through these beautiful embroidery books and you can see why I love them so much. Um, we'll put the details for these in um, the description below the videos if you want to go and have a look for those. We've got more videos as well about um, some beautiful books in my collection which I can't wait to show you. So if you're enjoying these, do li um, let us know below. Do leave us a message. It's always nice to have a chat with you. Um, and we'll see you in the next video.